<laughs> Thanks for that reminder. Uh, yeah, so the recording is on now. Um, so, so today we will be um, covering the doctrine of Trinity. Uh, now, as we know, the concept of Trinity, it's a very unique idea. We don't really see this in any of the other religions. Um, in fact, that word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, but there are verses which describe the Trinity of God. So when scholars were looking at the Bible and they saw many scriptures which seemed to indicate that the one God uh, is in three persons, when they saw that they wanted to come up with some word which can describe what they are seeing in the scriptures. So they came up with this term, tri-unity, um, oneness, uh, uh, three in oneness. That was the idea, tri-unity, three in oneness. So that term, tri-unity, turned into trinity. That's basically uh, what we describe this nature of God as. Um, so he is one but he is also three persons. Now, um, how do we really understand this? Um, we can't completely understand it, uh, simply because we have been created human, and humans do not have this capacity of being one and also being three. So we only understand what has already been created over here on the Earth. And we don't see anything in creation which clearly represents this aspect of someone being one and also being three. So which is why it's something beyond our understanding. Um, to use an example, a rather simple example, this was actually a missionary story that I had read a long time ago. So I don't quite remember the region, the details, uh, but this was what um, they had written uh, this was missionary work that was going on in some very remote tribal area uh, a region which had never seen ice or snowfall so for them that was a completely new concept uh, and so these missionaries were working among them and they began to translate the bible into the language of those uh, tribals and uh, as they were doing that when they came to Psalm 51, verse 7, um, they had to translate that portion where it says that, Lord, if you clean me, I will be as white as snow. And that particular community has no word in their local language for snow because they're not even aware that such a thing exists. And so um, the missionaries tried to explain the concept of snow to them. They told them, uh, you know, water comes down from the sky, which of course the tribals are familiar with. They are very much familiar with rain. But the missionaries told them uh, the water comes down uh, in solid form and it falls on the ground. And the people could not understand what was being said. Um, and then about a year later, uh, when some of the missionaries were going back uh, to Europe, uh, they took one of the tribals along with them, you know, so that he can talk about his community um, back in their uh, headquarters. So when he went over there, for the first time, he saw with his eyes water in solid form falling on the ground and in fact covering the entire town. And then after having looked at it, he understood, oh, okay, this is how solid water looks when it lands on the ground. So then when he finally went back to his tribal community, he explained what he had seen, and then it made more sense to them. So the Trinity is something like that. Without having seen it, it is difficult for us to understand it. Um, so all we can do is try to understand what is being presented in the Bible, uh, but someday, if we are allowed to see you know, something like that with our physical eyes in, the, in heaven, then maybe we will have a clearer idea of how exactly Trinity is seen and how it expresses itself. 
okay so this is something that we are discussing which we have not fully understood but there are so many scriptures in the bible which which describe uh, god in three persons so there's no doubt about that um in the old testament we see some hints of that you know in the in in the um early books uh, for instance in genesis 126 where god says let us make man it seems to indicate that the one god is plural rather than singular in the same way when you uh, look at genesis 322 after uh, you know adam and eve have sinned at that time the lord says man has become like one of us you know knowing good from evil so again that plural us is used over there and a singular god is talking but he expresses himself as us and we see the same thing again in isaiah 68 where um, the lord says whom shall i send who will go for us so over there in that uh, verse we see him addressing himself as i and he also addresses himself as us so um, all of these verses must have given the old testament israelites an idea that yahweh is one god but there seems to be some kind of a plurality in him they must have at least caught the idea and then um, of course you have isaiah 9 uh, verses 6 to 7 uh, especially isaiah 9 6 where you uh, where there is talk about the messiah who will come in the future uh, in fact in isaiah 9 7 it says that this messiah uh, will reign on david's throne and this is how this messiah is described he is described in isaiah 9 6 as mighty god everlasting father those are the terms which you would use for an for a uh, everlasting god who doesn't have any beginning and who has no end you know it's talking about an infinite eternal god so those are the terms which are used for the messiah who is going to come in future so at least after having looked at that verse the israelite community should have understood that yahweh is one but there also seems to be more than one person involved in this one being in this one divine being they must have you know understood that um but by the time you have uh, jesus coming by that time most of the leaders the the uh, high priest the religious leaders they no longer really believed in this idea that the messiah would be divine not particularly sure why maybe it was just a blindness which was given to them by satan maybe they hardened their hearts and chose to ignore Isaiah 9:6 but by the time of Jesus day they had it very firmly in their heads that the messiah would be a human messiah he would be a descendant of david he would be a very powerful and strong man and he would be able to defeat all the enemies of the nation of israel and raise up israel status into a politically independent nation that was the concept they had in their mind and they very conveniently forgot all about isaiah 96 where the messiah is referred to as mighty god where he is referred to as everlasting father those are the terms which are used for the messiah but they chose to ignore that scripture and so um uh, psalm 1101 which clearly talks about the messiah being divine they uh, never really understood what that verse meant but for jesus that was a very important verse he repeats it quite a few times in the gospels psalm 110 verse 1 so if we could have someone read out for us psalm 110 verse 1 please psalm 110 which verse ma'am verse 1 verse 1 the lord says to my lord sit at my right hand until i make your enemies your footstool yeah so um here david is writing this psalm 
and he is saying the lord says to my lord uh, sit at my right hand and um, if you were to look in your english bibles you would see that the first lord is um, in capital letters l o r d are all in caps all in capital letters so that is the english way of saying that the word being used over there is yahweh and then when you look at the second lord which is mentioned over there that has a capital l but then you have a small o r d so that is the english translation for uh, adonai adonai was a old testament term which basically meant master so it was a common term that was there in the society of those days so if a man has got let us say uh, 20 slaves he is basically the adonai of those 20 slaves he is the master of those 20 slaves so this was a term which was used commonly uh, to mean master but when it came to the old testament scriptures by and by this term began to be used exclusively for god so in the old testament scriptures wherever you find the word adonai uh, it always refers to a divine god rather than just simply a human master with a bunch of slaves uh, so psalm 110 verse 1 is basically saying this uh, when it says the lord says to my lord uh the actual translation would be yahweh says to my adonai yahweh says to my lord sit at my right hand so jesus you know deliberately brings up this point when he is talking to the pharisees because the pharisees and the rest of the important leaders of uh, israel at that time are refusing to even accept are refusing to even consider the fact that the messiah is divine every time jesus says i am divine they get very very angry they pick up stones to stone him and so he wants to point out to them that in the old testament it is stated that the messiah when he comes he is going to be divine he wants them to you know at least uh, understand that truth based on the old testament scriptures which they are supposed to be familiar with and so he brings up this topic in matthew 22 41 to 46 So if we if we could have someone read out for us this uh, portion, Matthew twenty two forty one to forty six. Matthew twenty two forty one to forty six. <clears throat> Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, "What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he?" They said to him, "The son of David." He said to them, "How is it then that David?" in the spirit calls him lord saying the lord said to my lord sit at my right hand until i put your enemies under your feet if then david calls him lord how is he his son and no one was able to answer him a word nor from that day did any one dare to ask him any more questions so here in this passage um jesus says under the inspiration of the holy spirit david said about his descendant he was talking about his descendant and under the inspiration of the holy spirit he referred to this descendant as adonai so jesus says uh, why why did he do such a thing i mean especially in that you know um, uh, middle eastern culture and in fact even in our asian culture elders are respected uh, so it is the youngsters who will you know the, the younger generations who will address the older generations as lord and master with and use respectful terms you will never have one of the elders referring to a youngster or descendant of his as lord it it would not make sense at all in our you know in our culture so um so jesus i uh, know raises this question and he says how come david the king when he's talking about a descendant of his who's going to be born some day in the future he shows such respect when referring to him and calls him adonai uh, because when the conversation begins uh, this is what jesus asks the pharisees he says what do you think about the messiah whose son is he 
and that they know very very well they know that the messiah is going to be a dis uh, descendant of david so they very confidently say it's a son of david a son of david will be the messiah so that is when jesus asks and says okay if this is going to be a son of david a descendant of david why does david talk about him so respectfully as though this descendant is superior to him and you know actually refers to him as adonai and it says in verse 46 no one could say a word in reply because this is a fact which they are not willing to accept and it says from that day on no one dare to ask him any more questions because if they ask him questions he's going to refer to the old testament and start talking about the divinity of the messiah and that's not something that they are willing to accept in fact you know um if we were to look at the four gospels and we look at the trial of jesus you know which happens at the end of each of the four gospels if you look in all the four gospels um in matthew mark luke very clearly jesus refers to psalm 110 verse 1 and he says on that day you will see the son of man seated next to uh, you know uh, to 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 the lord and in all the three gospels matthew mark luke when he says that the son of man you will see the son of man basically he's you know referring to himself it is you will see me seated next to the uh, to yahweh when he says that they get very angry and they say oh he's speaking blasphemy you know let's give him the death sentence in uh, the gospel of john we don't have uh, details about the trial which takes place in front of the uh, religious leaders but then when they are talking to pilot that is what they say to pilot they say this man is referring to himself as the son of god therefore he should be given the death sentence and pilot who does not want to get involved in spiritual matters of the jews he says why don't you go and try it out in your own courts i you know and then they say no no we want the death sentence and we don't we don't have the legal authority under the romans to give the death sentence so you need to do that for us uh, so in all these four gospels the religious leaders refused to accept the divinity of the messiah and uh, but jesus very clearly points out that yahweh um and he you know adonai they both are divine they both are equally god so in the old testament we do see a clear reference to the divinity of the messiah what about the holy spirit is the holy spirit described as being a separate person and as being divine uh, in isaiah 63 verse 10 it says they rebelled and grieved his holy spirit so in isaiah 63:10 um the holy spirit is also indicated as being a divine person okay so there are references in the old testament to the divinity of the godhead now what about the new testament in the new testament we see scriptures where you have the three persons of the trinity being mentioned as three distinct persons uh, let's just look at a, at a few examples of that um if someone could read out for us ephesians chapter 4 verses 4 to 6 ephesians 4 4 to 6 ephesians 4 4 to 6 there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call one lord one faith one baptism one god and the, and father of all who is over all and through all and in all if you were to look at these verses separate reference is made to the three persons of the trinity in verse 4 you have one spirit being mentioned and then in verse 5 you have one lord being mentioned which refers to jesus christ and then in verse 6 you have one god and father being mentioned they are mentioned as three separate persons um if we can also look at first peter chapter 1 verse 2 first peter chapter 1 verse 2 first peter chapter 1 verse 2 according to the for knowledge of god the father in the sanctification of the spirit for obedience to jesus christ and for sprinkling with his blood here peter is talking about believers and he says that these believers are chosen 
according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Three separate persons of the Trinity are being mentioned over here in 1 Peter. And then we see the same thing again in Jude, uh, verses 20 and 21. Jude has only one chapter. So the verses are 20 and 21, if you could read out. Jude 20 and 21. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep your, yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So here Jude is urging the believers to pray in the Holy Spirit. Why? So that they can keep themselves in God's love, uh, even as they wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. That is, you know, in the sense he's going to take them to heaven and he is going to uh, grant them resurrected bodies. So um, again, here we see the three persons of the Trinity being mentioned uh, as three distinct persons. What did Jesus himself say about the Trinity? Maybe we can look at a few scriptures where he says something. Now, the Jewish community, they had something called the Shema. Uh, the word Shema literally means to hear and to obey. And uh, this term Shema, to hear and to obey, it was applied to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. So uh, I don't know about the, today, but at least in biblical times, Almost every single uh, Jewish person would by heart these verses. Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 9. They would know these verses by heart. And this is what they called Shema. So every day uh, in the morning, they would quote these verses. And this is basically how the Shema begins. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one and now here in the new testament jesus quotes that same verse uh, when somebody comes to him and say asks him which is the greatest commandment at that time um, in mark chapter 12 verses 28 to 30 jesus quotes the shema and he says um, in uh, mark 12 29 he says hear o israel the lord our god the lord is one so Jesus acknowledged the truth. He acknowledged the fact that um, Yahweh is one. He's one single God. However, uh, let's look at what he also says, what Jesus also says about the Trinitarian aspect of this one God. For instance, uh, maybe we could read out Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, which refers to God the Father. Matthew 6, verse 26. Matthew 6, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Here, it's not talking about any human father. Here, Jesus very clearly refers to God as heavenly Father. So here, Jesus is um, declaring the Father as God. In fact, in uh, one of the next verses, he says, God who has sown the, um, the flowers in the field. You know, so over there, uh, he uses the term God. So he uses the words Heavenly Father and God interchangeably, indicating that God is the Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father is God. So God the Father in Jesus' uh, mind is definitely divine. Um, how does he refer to himself? He says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. So he's declaring and saying that the Father is divine. The Father is God. And then he's making this statement, this divine Father and I, we are one. So he's saying that I also am fully divine. That's the claim that he is making about himself. And then what does he say about the Holy Spirit? Now this, of course, you would be familiar with because last semester you did a detailed course on uh, the Holy Spirit. 
So uh, John 14 verse 16, if, you, if we could have someone read out. John 14, 16. John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So um, Jesus is comforting his disciples who are feeling bad that Jesus is saying he's going away somewhere. They don't know where he's going. They're kind of concerned. And then Jesus assures them and he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to help you and be with you forever. Because Jesus had been with them for three years now. He had been helping them. He was always there for them, always listen to him, you know, ready to listen to them in case they come and sit with him and express their sorrows and what's going on in their hearts. He's always been there for them. And now he's saying he's going away and they're feeling very upset. He says, don't worry. I will, uh, you know, I'll ask the father specifically and he will give you another helper. And then, you know, in your class, you must have, you know, um, read about this, been taught about this, about how that word, the Greek word used over there, another, it's the word uh, loss. Um, but for those who probably did not attend that particular course and who have only joined for, this, uh, for the doctrinal foundations, let's just very quickly go through that. Um, so the word that Jesus uses over there, he says, the, I will ask the father and he will give you alos helper, another helper. So the Greek word used over there for another is the word alos. But actually in Greek, there are two words for another. The first word is alos, which means another. There is another word heteros, which also means another. But the difference between these two words is when you're saying alos, you're saying another of the same kind, another of the same type. But when you're using the word heteros, you're talking about another of a different type. So to use a very simple example, if I am holding a apple in my hand and I say to Sabita, give me alos. I'm holding the apple in my hand and I say to her, give me a loss, give me another. So if I'm holding a Shimla apple in my hand and she gives me a Chikbalapur apple, I will say, no, that's not what I asked for. I asked for a loss, another of the same kind, another of the same type. So poor thing, she has to go and you know search for a Shimla apple and come and give that to me. Only then I'll be satisfied. On the other hand, if I'm holding an apple in my hand, and I say to her, um, give me heteros fruit. So I'm using the word heteros, which means another of a different kind. So if she goes and brings me an apple, I'll say, I asked for a different kind. Why are you giving me an apple? So which means she would have to go and bring me an orange or a banana or a guava or something else. So that is the difference. And so Jesus is saying to them, don't worry, I'm going away, but I'm going to be sending Alos helper, someone who's exactly like me, someone who's, uh, you know, the same as me. So he will be your helper in the same way I have been your helper and he will be with you forever. That's the deep assurance that he gives his uh, disciples. So we see that in Jesus thinking, the father, he himself, the son and the Holy Spirit are all divine. That's basically what Jesus is declaring in the scriptures very, very openly. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Yeah, if someone could um, read out 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Here, um, Paul is telling the Corinthians... Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? So, you know, you need to conduct yourselves in an honorable manner because you believers, you are God's temple. And then, of course, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, this is what is said. It says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? So here in this chapter 6, the same Paul is talking to the same Corinthians and he's saying to them that your same bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So in 1 Corinthians 3, he referred to them as God's temple. In 1 Corinthians 6, he is now referring to them as 
Holy Spirit's temple. In other words, he's equating God and the Holy Spirit and declaring that the Holy Spirit is equally divine as the Father and the Son. Okay, so um, the scriptures are very, very clear about the triune status of uh, the Godhead. Now, um, there was this question which someone had asked me a long time ago. They said, uh, if God is triune, then whom should I pray to? Whom should I pray to so that my prayers get answered nicely? Because if I pray to the wrong party, maybe my prayers will not get answered. So uh, this is the verse which kind of touches upon it. Uh, you have Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. If we can have someone read out that. Ephesians 2, verse 18. Ephesians 2, verse 18. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Yeah. Uh, so in the NIV it would say, for through him, Jesus, okay? For through Jesus, we both, and the both over there is referring to both Gen Jews and Gentiles. So through Jesus, we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access to whom? We have access to the Father. Through Jesus, we have access to the Father by one spirit, with the help of the spirit. So at least if you look at this particular scripture, the access is being given to the Father to pray to him, to address our requests to him. But how do we approach this father? Only one single way to the father. Jesus makes that very clear. He says the only way to the father is through the son. No other route, no other way of reaching out to this, you know, to God. So um, we have access to the heavenly father through the blood of Jesus, through the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross, through the finished work of the cross, we have access to the Father by one Spirit, that is uh, through the enabling and leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to pray, what to pray, uh, what to say to the Father when we are praying. So we have access to the Father through the work of Jesus Christ with the help of the Spirit who enables us and helps us even as we are praying. So technically, I would say that we should be praying to the Father. But then in our Christian minds, we are so used to this whole idea of Trinity that we start off the sentence by addressing the Father. Halfway through the sentence, it becomes Jesus. And then by the end of it, we are saying, Holy Spirit, help us. So that happens all the time. And I really don't think the Lord minds. Because we are actually acknowledging the Trinity and saying, yes, Lord, we know you're a triune God. So I don't think God is very legalistic about it, especially because we humans are not really able to understand his triune nature completely clearly. So it's really all right. So if you are suddenly catch yourself praying to Jesus or to the Holy Spirit, it's totally all right. Because there is no rivalry in the Trinity. They all are united. Uh, so it really doesn't, they, don't, they won't mind whether you're addressing the Father or you're addressing Jesus. So uh, when it comes to actual practice, it's all right. But the, the scripture is basically, you know, explaining that the access is to the Father through the finished work of Jesus. And we access the Father and speak to him with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, so having looked at all of these verses, uh, what are we finally saying? There are three statements which we are making regarding the Trinity based on all the verses that we have looked at so far. So the first thing that we are saying is uh, God is three persons. Okay, so um, in John 3.16, what do we see? It says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So, yes, he knows his scriptures. So, God the Father, he sends the Son. If he is sending the Son, he cannot be the Son, which means the Father and Son are two separate persons. God the Father is sending the Son, and the uh, Son that he is sending is going to be on the earth, but God the Father is going to continue in heaven, which means they are clearly two separate, distinct persons. 
and then uh, what does jesus say in acts chapter okay not jesus he is not speaking over here um it's uh, luke who's recording this so in acts chapter 2 verses 32 and 33 what do we see luke writing acts 2 32 to 33 acts 2 32 to 33 this jesus god raised up and of that we all are witness being therefore exalted at the right hand of god and having received from the father the promise of the holy spirit he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing yes so in john jesus made a promise to his disciples he said i'll ask the father and then the father will give you the holy spirit so now that that promise is getting fulfilled over here so in acts chapter 2 verse 33 it says exalted to the right hand of god jesus has received from the father the promised holy spirit whom he has now poured out on all these people you know who have accepted the gospel message this is basically you know peter standing over there he's preaching is telling them this jesus he's the uh, divine living messiah uh, who has been raised from the dead so you need to place your faith in him so in the course of that um uh, sermon as he is preaching all the people who uh, you know uh, believe what is being said um they would have received the holy spirit uh, so um he is of course referring to the um, upper room experience where the people who had gathered over there the 120 who had gathered over there upon them the holy spirit was poured out so he says um jesus who has now been resurrected and who has now been exalted to the right hand of god he has finished receiving from the father the promised holy spirit and he is now he has now poured out this holy spirit upon all of us who are speaking in tongues and then all the people who were gathered over there a large number of them believed so they too would have received the holy spirit so if you see over you see over here now it is basically the father and jesus who are together sending the holy spirit So in John three sixteen we saw the Father sending the Son. Here we see the Father and the Son together sending the Holy Spirit, which clearly shows that the, all three of them are three very clear, distinct persons. The second statement which we accept based on all the scriptures which we have looked at, we would say that yes, God is three persons, and we also say each of the persons is fully, completely God. you know they are not like partially god they are all fully god um if we could have someone read out philippians 1 verse 2 philippians chapter 1 verse 2 grace to you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ here the father is being referred to as god so um the father is fully completely god is fully completely divine what about the son you know is he fully god uh, titus chapter 2 verse 13 a very interesting description of jesus titus 2 13 this chapter 2 verse 13 looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great god and savior jesus christ jesus christ is clearly referred to over here as our great god so here jesus is very clearly being referred to as divine fully divine he is being referred to as great god colossians 2:9 that is a that is a very important verse for us colossians 2 9 if someone could read out colossians colossians chapter 2 verse 9 for in him dwells all the fullness of the good head bodily bodily all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form in this jesus christ so jesus is fully divine not partially divine is fully divine and then what about the holy spirit um i mean we already looked at various scriptures um just to look at another one you know this the this passage about um ananias and sapphira who told lies uh, to peter and what does peter say 
you are not just telling your lies to me you are telling these lies to god and this is what he says in that passage acts chapter 5 verses 3 to 4 so in acts chapter 5 verses 3 and 4 in verse 3 peter says you have lied to the holy spirit and then in verse 4 he says you have not lied just to human beings but to god so he equates god and the holy spirit in this passage so the holy spirit is declared as being fully god in this uh, passage so the first statement we accept is that god is three persons the second statement which we have accepted is that each person in this trinity is fully completely god and the third statement of course is that there is only one god okay so um uh, which sounds like a controversy uh, but then that's the nature of the trinity so we uh, we have isaiah 45 verses 5 to 6 where god is saying about himself i am the lord and there is no other in fact he repeats it again in verse 6 isaiah 45 5 and 6 he says i am the lord and there is no other i am only one single god is what he declares and um, so what do we do with this he says that he is one god but at the same time in so many places he describes himself as being three persons how are we to understand this um now uh, this is something that you know you you might have uh, you know already studied in your other courses uh, where you know the, the baptismal formula that is used you know during the time of baptism uh, so maybe we could actually read out that matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 matthew 28 19 and 20 if someone could read out matthew chapter 28 was 19 go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit so the all the decide all the believers who are going to be baptized they are being baptized in the name of how many in the names of how many people if you look over here it says that they are all being baptized in the name of not in the names of so they being baptized in the name of one person but this one name has basically three persons attached to it okay so um, the believers the disciples when we baptize them we don't you know we don't uh, stand there in the water and we say uh, we don't we do not say i am baptizing you in the names of the father son and holy spirit no we say we are you are being baptized right now in the name of only one name one god but that one god is in three persons um in those days um uh, it was sometime i think during the maybe about uh, 200 or 300 years before the birth of jesus christ that this whole idea of baptism started um where you had godly people uh, who wanted to teach about the truth of god's word you know because there was a lot of backsliding which had taken place people uh, had gone far away from god so you had this religious groups rising up here and there uh, and and they are trying to restore the israelites back to their faith so that the coming of the messiah will not be delayed so they're trying to prepare people's hearts and so you had these religious leaders uh, who would go from place to place preaching and then some people who are you know um, uh convinced by what they are teaching they would choose to become followers of that particular leader so then what the leader would do is he would take them to a nearby river and he would baptize them and basically that uh, that that ritual of baptism would indicate from now on i am a follower of this particular leader so that's basically what even john the baptist did he baptized people uh who's who are who are stating that they are repenting of their sins and so all the people who are being baptized by john the baptist or his disciples they all become followers of john the baptist so over here look at how these new testament believers are going to be baptized whose followers are they going to become they are going to become the followers of one name one god they are not going to become the followers of three separate gods no 
they are going to become the followers of one god yahweh but yahweh is three persons okay so uh, we need to keep that in mind um so this is basically jesus you know giving his great commission over here in matthew chapter 28 verses 19 to 20 so he's the one who says when you go and start baptizing these believers baptize them in the name singular one name of the father son and holy spirit so if jesus mentioned them in this particular order father son holy spirit does it mean that father is like the most superior and then little below that comes jesus and then poor holy spirit is like even less than that is there a ranking like that not really when we look at different scriptures we see that they change the order of these three uh, names um, you know we already looked at three scriptures a uh, new testament scriptures which uh, where you have the three persons of the trinity mentioned if you go back and look at those three verses you will see that the order changes um we'll just look at one example now um second corinthians 13 verse 14 you know which is basically our benediction second corinthians 13 verse 14 if someone could read out second corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the communion of the holy spirit be with you all amen so here in this particular verse uh the jesus christ is being mentioned first god the father is being mentioned second and the holy spirit is being mentioned third but don't worry there are there are, in, in this this is other scripture which we read out when we were doing those three uh, you know those three verses from the new testament where the holy spirit was mentioned first that was the efficient passage yeah so the holy spirit is mentioned first over there and second i think it was jesus yeah he's referred to as one lord and then uh, in the next verse you have uh, ephesians 2:6 you have one god and father being mentioned so over there the holy spirit is mentioned first so there's no ranking they're all equal it's not like one is superior to the other they're all equal okay so, um so um how do we understand this concept of trinity what can we say about it it's 1048 do i really want to get into this weighty issue now on the other hand i hate wasting time okay fine you can have your bonus 2 minutes um because you know we need to get into this we need to dive into this topic it's going to take time and effort uh so yes you can leave early but please be back at 11 o'clock